Hello, coming to you live from Atlanta and the Chicago area. It's the Movie Change Up Podcast. This is our weekly Disney Plus review. I got me and uh, Tristan here. Tristan and I, I guess, if I want to be grammatically correct. Uh, I'm rocking my political party shirt because I just happen to be wearing this shirt. And tomorrow happens to be the 4th of July, one of the days in America where we celebrate freedom. So, uh, Tristan, uh, it's our Disney Plus review. Uh, I think normally we have a third thing review, but I don't think we really had anything this week. I think we're mainly just going to stick to uh, the Loki episode and the Bad Batch episode. So, kind of, what were your overall thoughts? This is a good week for Disney Plus. I'm feeling pretty good. A big week for Loki. Uh, I think last week some people were a little bit like, oh, when are they going to give us answers? When are they going to do this or that? And they gave us all kinds of answers this week. It'll be fun to talk about that one. And Bad Batch was definitely sort of this admission of the week kind of episode. It was like, oh, go here, do this thing. And come back but i think it worked it was a fun kind of way to see the bad badge have some action and also just enough of a lore there to keep me keep me going <laughs> so i'm excited yeah. to talk about the two episodes yeah I, uh, yeah we'll get to it when we when uh we get to that episode but i'd love and i have my boba fett t-shirt on nice. it's not showing much well on the camera but it, yeah i'm showing it off now Nice. I, I hope one day we get an in-depth description of how hollow chess works maybe we can get some kind of video <laughs> game release uh, that'd be fun. Uh, but let's get started. Let's start off with the Loki episode. This was season one, episode four, I believe. And Tom Hiddleston teased that this episode's going to take a different turn, and I definitely believe it did. So uh, you normally keep notes on these shows as you watch them. I watched this episode Wednesday, and then I watched it again this morning as I was doing some other things. So Yeah, I've now watched this one three times. It was a nice time loop for me. Uh mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty good episode, though. I'll start this, like I, like you said, I took a bunch of notes here, and I did a lot this week. I tried to even put little notes in there, so where to let Joe talk? <laughs> so we'll, we'll try to do good with that. But we'll I, like to, I like to hear you talk, because like, you go in, you give your in-depth analysis, and then I come in with, like, a, oh, did you know this was a reference to this? Or, oh, I like how this tied into that, or this was a good scene. I, I like our dynamic. You talk, I listen, and give like a little <laughs> input here and there. That's our dynamic. Works for me. A lot of talking this week. We start with the flashback to Sylvie, her childhood yeah. on Asgard. We kind of see young Sylvie here playing with yeah. uh, a Valkyrie toy and a handful of like Viking-looking ships, and she's just doing normal kid stuff, playing with toys, and all of a sudden the TVA shows up and says, you've committed a crime against a sacred timeline, you're under arrest, and takes her away. Uh, just any thoughts on this opening scene right here before we get into the TVA stuff? Uh, yeah, there's actually, uh, there's two things I like about the scene. One, there's a Star Wars connection to this scene. Uh, if you didn't know, I'm pretty sure I saw that the actress that plays young Sylvie plays young Rey in The Force Awakens, so that's kind of a nice, uh, connection wow, it's there. Wow, canon now, I think, multiverse. Yeah, yeah that Sylvie, Rey, same character. And then another <laughs> thing, it kind of shows that, because if you saw in Ragnarok, um, uh, Thor has had like this affinity or kind of crush or like appreciation uh, for the Valkyrie and then you see in the story that Sylvie was kind of telling with her toys that she is like a female Loki kind of had that same admiration and appreciation for the Valkyrie and like Thor said in the scene that he wanted to be a Valkyrie but he turns out it's only women and then as she's playing with the toys telling this heroic tale of the Valkyrie the TVA comes in and takes her away because she's a variant. And the one thing I think is kind of interesting about this scene and like cause she asks later on why she's a variant. And I, like I, we say a million times on this podcast, hey, we'll talk about our theories at the end. But my theory on this is it wasn't because she was a female Loki, because if that was the case, as soon as she was born, they would have been like, oh, she's a variant and taken her away. I think it was because this uh, Loki was headed down a heroic path. She was telling the heroic tale of the Valkyrie. It was kind of this hero story. So I think that's kind of why uh, the TVA came and take her is because she was on her journey. She was on the journey to be a hero and not a villain. So I do think we're going to get an answer of what her crime against the timeline was. They made a point of the fact that Renslayer knows and didn't say anything this week, and I imagine she's see, in I a much more compromised position than Belly in the episode, so I'm thinking she'll have some answers next week. See, I think to tie into that scene in the end, I think she, Renslayer truly just doesn't know, and I think that's almost more heartbreaking. Is like her death was the reason for her death and destruction, and like her whole universe's deletion uh, was so like unimportant to Renslayer that she just forgot. And I almost think yeah, that's I... more heartbreaking and more dramatic than her like knowing and not saying anything 
I like your theory a lot. I think that's probably the direction I'll go, but I'll give mine really quickly because you mentioned it there that maybe Renslayer truly doesn't know and her crime against the timeline, the thing she did that was so bad that she, her entire timeline had to be erased with some minuscule thing. She played with the toys one direction instead of the other. She played instead of going out to school. Some little tiny choice that in the consequence of a life is nothing, but in the consequence of this supposed sacred timeline is yep. a huge big deal. So I think either way is interesting if she does, she was set for a hero path, and this was them saying, oh, Loki's can't be good, she's going down. Or if it was just some random butterfly effect thing, oh, you play with your toys too long, or you didn't do this or that, so you're getting reset. But we don't find out that here, because uh, we go through where Sylvie is going through sort of the same integration process Loki goes through in the first episode here. She's sort of going through all the same different rooms, the room where the guy's stacking up what you've said, and of course... Sylvie is not nearly as tall as Loki's a child at this point. So nice detail was like her stack of papers was like this and Loki's was like all the way up to here, you know? Yeah. So, and there are even little tiny things where you can see like oh, over the course of the last, what, however many years between then and now, the TV has changed a little bit. And you see like there's a cat in the background and Loki's is not there in the first one. So it's like, oh, they went and they got a cat. <laughs> little things like that. Yeah. And then the... but I think it's the desk guy is different too because it's charlie or whatever it is now but it's a different guy when sylvie was taken that is interesting and as as we know these are all these are all uh variants and that's something to keep in mind i think as we go through like it kind of adds a lot of empathy to me for these random tva agents we see like oh these aren't just like goons that work for a corporation they've essentially been like brainwashed into into believing this but uh, yeah, Sylvie goes through all the same kind of steps that Loki goes through. But once she gets to her trial, where Loki has that thing, oh, I plead guilty of being the god of mischief or something like that, she doesn't get a chance to even do that because she steals the little time machine from uh, the soldier who captured her that we learn later is Runslayer. And she grabs that time machine and jumps into a portal and takes off. And then, of course, that's where we get the reveal that this soldier who arrested her and then let her go free is Renslayer, the one who's now kind of the the head of the TVA directly contact to the time keepers. And one, uh, one thing what do you to, think of that reveal there, Joe? Uh, I, I like that. Re I kind of saw that reveal coming. I saw they had a shot from the back and you could kind of see her hair like tied in a knot or like tied like in a ponytail type thing. And I could tell it was like kind of similar hair texture as uh, Kugu and Batha Ra who plays Renslayer, so I, I I didn't even really think of it even as it was supposed to be a reveal because I saw the back of her head and I'm like oh that's definitely uh, Renslayer. But one thing I wanted to add is uh, all of these uh, TVA agents have like code numbers and code letters, and Renslayer's is A23, and the first appearance of Renslayer in the comics was Avengers 23 in the 60s, and that's also an issue where Kang the Conqueror kidnaps the Avengers. So just thought I'd interesting. That in there. Yeah, I love when they do those little details, and as soon as you see, like, oh, a couple of numbers together in a letter, like, oh, that's got to be an issue of a comic. Yeah, that happened. Because <laughs> they don't seem to pick those things randomly. Yeah, I can't remember if it was the end of Justice League. No, it was the end of Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Uh, Great uh, movie. Lex Luthor's uh, prison number was also his, like, when he was introduced into comics. His prison number was, like, AC something, 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 which was stood for Action Comics, and then whatever issue he debuted in. All right, and, and then the obvious reveal that Joe said he was so far ahead of everybody on happens. But then, of course, Renslayer walks in out of the golden elevators that we got teased, and then we get the our reveal here of the timekeepers, these very mysterious and creepy beings that are these giant glowing red eyes and fog machines and all kind of crazy visuals, and that's our first shot. Joe, what, did you buy into this timekeeper stuff? Did you think these were the real timekeepers? What's going on? So when they first showed the timekeepers, I'm like, one of two things. Either they blew their budget on everything else, and these timekeepers look fucking terrible, or they're fake. And I was leaning more towards fake, because I had been assuming they were fake for a while. And so when they cut off the head of one of the timekeepers, and I saw sparks from their head, <laughs> I'm immediately like, okay, they're fake. But to tie into, not really a theory, but more just, like, a connection to another thing I saw of, like, the whole Wizard of Oz of it all, of these two characters, or these characters going on a journey, looking for something, and then the whole time it's like, oh, don't look, don't go over there, the timekeeper's over there, you're not allowed over there, don't go over there, and they go, it turns out it's fake. 
I know I, I just like I mean that's definitely kind of what they were going for definitely in the back of their minds just the Wizard of Oz and that whole thing and I, I like that connection they, they were even in a big green room so <laughs> yeah I I definitely saw the Wizard of Oz connection there and we'll talk a bit more about the like the time the robot thing towards the end but I did I kind of like the visuals of the timekeepers i was i'm sure there was some kind of second later reveal to it but i thought it was kind of this this whole show is going for like a 1950s sci-fi kind of aesthetic and i thought it it kind of worked like these glowing red eyes these really scary like yeah. huge powerful beings and, and even though i didn't buy into them necessarily i did see like why someone like run slayer who's been in the tv every whole life would see that and believe that and be scared of that because if i was sitting in that room and there were all those effects and these big booming voices from these scary looking aliens are coming at me i would i'd probably buy into that <laughs> you yeah. know yeah i could see that one of the things too that kind of t- let me know that they were fake is uh each week i think on like monday or tuesday uh disney plus is revealing character posters because normally for like the star wars shows they do the character posters like the monday or tuesday after the episode for the marvel shows they seem to be doing it before the episode and uh it's always for like whatever character is gonna have a big moment or like in the show or kind of be a big feature in the show and this time in this last character poster was the timekeepers but it was their statue versions of themselves that we see behind uh, i think it's renslayer or somebody it wasn't their actual forms and it's like at that point i'm like okay they're definitely not real if they're not going to show their real forms and just show like statues of them as their character poster and then uh, I will talk later about the Last Jedi vibes of this finale that I got, but I think this even gave me some Snoke vibes going in. <laughs> yeah. More Star Wars and, and uh, Loki crossover yeah. as we get towards the end here. But yeah, we get the Loki titles there breaking up. We get the timekeepers for a second, and then of course we're not going to come back to the end of the episode because now uh, Mobius is back at the TVA. He's trying to calm down Renslayer. Because, of course, she fears the worst. There's Lokis are out here. They're running. They're going to have some attacks and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, Renslayer is personally invested because she let Sylvie go. And in a, in a similar way, Mobius let Loki go. So I think both of these characters are, are on similar sort of paths at this point in their lives. And this is a point where Mobius is pushing a bit about talking to C20. You know, he's, he knows she's possessed by Sylvie. Maybe she can help me figure out this case with these Lokis and... Renslayer says you can't talk to her. She's dead, and says I'll keep that a secret. But yeah, she her mind was wiped and melted by Sylvie, and she's now dead. Yeah. What did you think of that reveal and that whole sequence there? Yeah, my whole thing was like, okay, you, like anyone with two brain cells can probably piece together that this woman's lying. Like her just being like, nope, don't look it up, don't work. Like anytime anyone tells you not to look something up or don't research something, uh, definitely has something to hide because if everything was on the up and up they'd be like yeah look and do it if you want to here's all the information you need but yeah unfortunately she died uh it sucks they wouldn't be like oh don't look over here this is not for you That's... yeah i think we get even a tons of line from Renslayer in the episode but this is the first big sign to mobius as a character that like something is up here and he's not getting the whole truth of it and i really like their relationship i like mobius a lot so it's it's heartbreaking to see him kind of learn that all the stuff he believed in is kind of a lie but i do like seeing this spy crafting of mobius this episode where he's sort of like scene by scene getting the pieces together and figuring it out sort of along the along the side of the audience doing the same kind of guesswork that we're doing and then finally giving us answers to it it goes into the same vibe of the cop show vibes we got towards the beginning of the show yeah and like that vibe still peaks up every once in a while but it's it's not as prevalent as it was in the first episode that cop show vibe but it's still definitely there yeah, speaking of not cap show vibes, we go from here to the end of the world. The moon is crashing into a planet. Uh, forgot about that from last week. Uh, Sylvie and Loki are at the ends of their wits here. I guess we were theorizing that maybe there was some second layer of plan here. Maybe Loki was lying. Maybe Sylvie was lying. Maybe somebody was on top of somebody else. And we could always get that towards the end. But it looks like they were just had to do- jump through some narrative hoops last week. And <laughs> it all played out pretty straight. Yep. But now they're stuck at kind of the apocalypse and they get this sort of heart to heart that I really enjoyed here a lot. One of the better uh, conversations of the episode where Sylvie's kind of recalling Asgard. She says she can't really remember it too well, but she has these little 
drifting memories of what it was like and then kind of has this monologue about how the universe kind of creates entropy and wants to create chaos and kind of thrives in creating these chaotic mistakes which is what they both are as variants and she has a line sort of like oh i was born at the end of a thousand worlds and that's where i'm going to die now and it had this really interesting like sci-fi doctor who vibes last mm-hmm. week and this is our last little little injection of doctor who it feels like something <laughs> that we said on that show yeah yeah, I get that. I've never been a big Doctor Who fan. I've seen, like, the Vincent Van Gogh episode because I'm a big Van Gogh fan, and then everyone says, like, oh, like, that's one of the best episodes ever. So I'm like, okay, I, I get this show. Am I ever going to watch it? Probably not. But <laughs> You know, I don't know if it's worth it at this point. But, uh, yeah, they definitely took notes from a lot of sci-fi stuff here, and we get this conversation here where, like, uh, they say, is this why we're Lokis? Is that, make, is that what makes Loki a Loki? Are we all destined mm-hmm. to lose? And Loki has the somewhat metal line of saying, no, we may lose sometimes painfully, but we don't die. We survive. Because, of course, Loki throughout the MCU has had so many encounters with death. But he has this confidence of, like, I've died before and I'm willing to face death again. Yeah, kind of reminds me of, like, the Peter Pan quote of, like, death would be a very big adventure. So Mm -hmm. definitely a lot of Peter Pan vibes from Loki at points. And how are you feeling about this Loki Sylvie relationship here? Because they start to really bond here, and their their bond yeah. is what sparks this up uh, this Nexus event, the title of the episode, and what kind of gets the TVA to rescue them. So, what is your read on this relationship? Is it romantic? Is it platonic? Is it uh, some kind of? I think it's like verging on romantic and kind of thing. So I saw an interview on TikTok of, I mean, like the interview wasn't like on TikTok, so they <laughs> recorded an interview and put it on TikTok, but of Tom Hiddleston and it was like he was doing promo stuff for the loki show and someone asked him like hey like you have the loki show coming out is there any way uh you could ever see yourself having like loki having a romantic partner on the show or will he have a romantic partner on the show and his response was something along the lines is like before you can love someone else you have to love yourself and he kind of said like a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing so i think that's kind of what the direction of this is, is i think it's like a romantic type thing I like that. I wasn't quite sure last week if it was going to be romantic or not. And this week definitely leans towards the romantic <laughs> end of it. Uh, I think that this connection moment here, especially, and people theorize like, oh, what was the Nexus event? What caused this huge spike? And I think it's very obviously the two Lokis caring about each other, whether that's romantically or platonically or just like the fact that a Loki cares about somebody else more than themselves for even a second <laughs> is something that I think is enough to create a Nexus event. And the fact that Loki's adopted makes it less weird for me that it's not like genetically his sister because if they're like if Loki was from the Frost Giants and Odin adopted him from the Frost Giants and then maybe like the Sylvie Loki female Loki is actually like the genetic daughter of Odin and Frigga so it's like they weren't raised together they're genetic like if you were to examine their god genetics they wouldn't be (laughs) identical so I'm not, like, grossed out by it, if that makes Look, sense. gods hooked up with other gods all the time in yeah. mythology, and I watched Game of Thrones. I've seen I've seen how far this can go, and I don't quite yeah. think Marvel's going to push wolf, it that like, far. So, Like I said in the last episode of our Disney Plus review, in Norse mythology, the wolf from Ragnarok is Loki's son, so... <laughs> Uh, all right i think we covered that scene right there yeah. i had a really good conversation though i think uh this relationship between the two of them is something that i'm really fascinated by and i'm excited to see we only got two episodes left so i wonder how much they can even do with that <laughs> i'm just really look into it it gave me some Raylo vibes this week yeah. yeah so i mentioned it before but everybody at the tva is kind of gathered around the timeline monitor and they see this huge spike you know they're watching the dogecoin come in they're like oh my god it's going <laughs> up and they Go Where out is there, Dogecoin they... at right now? Like 45 <laughs> cents? 10 cents? Yeah, not, one cent? not doing as good as it was, but still up there. Yeah. You know, I'm still making money on that one. That's good. And then, of course, the TV are making money too because they arrive just in time to rescue the two Lokis and bring them back in for interrogation. Yeah. Do you think it was so convenient that the TVA shows up and gets them right here, Joe? Uh, no, because I have my theory. Uh, I, I, I have my theory on what what caused the spike because they said oh it was like, like we're led to believe it's because they were like falling for each other and like but like who cares because they were um 
they were dying so whether they were in the middle of a fight or full on making out or having sex like that shouldn't have caused a nexus spike because they were about to die anyways I think it was more the fact that they were about to die and that's what caused the nexus spike it goes back to what Loki was just saying it's the thing about Loki's is they always survive so if the Lokis died then that would have caused the nexus spike so I don't think it was convenient that that's when they were pulled out because I think if that's what caused the spike then that makes sense that that's when the spike would have happened and that's when they would have been saved I agree with you. I think we'll talk more about theories towards the end, but I have I want to talk about that one a lot. All right, we're back at the TVA once again. Uh, we had a little tangent on this destroyed planet, but Loki's back here once again with Mobius, uh, and they have this second interrogation scene where Mobius is much more forward with Loki. He's not giving him that kind of charming "I'm your friend" kind of exterior, mm-hmm. and uh, L- Loki is trying to tell Mobius the truth he's saying things like uh, the TVA is lying to you and Mobius doesn't buy it of course and he sends Loki into a time loop prison and I you can tell though from the line of TVA is lying to you that he has this little bug in his head that's ticking at Mobius yeah. telling yeah. him something is off here and maybe I was right to question about C20 what did you think about Loki and Mobius reuniting and Loki deciding not to tell him that he's a variant yet uh, yeah, I think it was kind of interesting that he held that information. That's definitely very Loki of, like, like someone that's truly your friend. As soon as you, like, see them and know that information, you're going to be, like, wanting to tell them. But I feel like part of him was, like, I'm going to save this until an opportune time. But then as that opportune time was wasting away, he's like, well, this guy should know, so I'm going to tell him. Yeah, it was interesting because I figured it, as soon as you reunite with Mobius, that's the first thing you tell him, especially when you're alone in a room together. But Loki, of course, is trying to play his game still, even with people that care about him. Yep. So he hasn't told Mobius' truth just yet. But then we get a kind of memorable scene here. Uh, we get our Loki prison scene. Uh, he's locked in the memory of Asgard, where Lady Sif shows up and berates him for cutting her hair, uh, telling him he's a worm destined to be alone and beating him up. What do you think, Joe, of Sif's return yeah. here in this scene? So, in, like, middle school, high school age, like, mostly high school age, I was big into, like, Norse mythology and stuff, and that actually is a real story from Norse mythology of Loki cutting Lady Sif's hair, and that was at a time when uh, Lady Sif and Thor were married, so I just thought that wow. was kind of cool that they kind of brought real mythology into this random one-off scene that they could have done anything, and they're like, oh, let's include this kind of quote-unquote real story, so. Yeah, I thought it was fun, too, to see Lady Sif come back. It's a interesting pull from all the Thor characters and this one we haven't seen in a really yeah. long Just time like, but like also what's Jamie Alexander really up to you know <laughs> that's true but she showed up on an Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. so I was wondering like oh is Kevin Foggy like blacklisting Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. <laughs> anyone who is on there you're never part of the MCU again yeah alright and then we get our Loki prison scene he's locked in the memory of Asgard where a lady separates him and cutting her for cutting her hair telling him he's a worm destined to be alone and beating him up Yep. Joe, what'd you think of the scene here? God damn it, you fucking... I thought you were going to do this, and then here we are. <laughs> in this in this moment. Again. Again. It's Groundhog you know? Day. <laughs> Again. Look, I'll, I'll spare you the repeating of that, and say Loki repeats that scene again and again and again <laughs> and again. And eventually he... I'll, there's a couple of scenes like in between this, but it's a little confusing on the order of scenes. But Loki does kind of confess to Sif, like, you're right, I'm I'm an asshole, I'm a narcissist, and I'm do this stuff for attention because I'm terrified of being alone for the rest of my life. And she picks him up and kind of comforts him for half a second, but then says, you are alone, and you're always going to be alone. And yeah. that breaks Loki's heart, but just in time for uh, Mobius to pull him out for a second interrogation. And then Mobius, and this is, I think this is the scene here where Loki tells Mobius the whole story here. Uh, so Mobius and, and Loki have this second conversation where Loki fills him in on the whole reality and and, Loki, and Mobius kind of gets this vibe on Loki. Well, first, Loki's trying to lie and say, oh, this whole plan was my idea. I wasn't sure if that was in this scene or the last scene, but Loki has this yeah. arc where he says, oh, this is my my plan, actually. She answers to me, and I was doing it from the start. It was the whole plan to take them the timekeepers. And Mobius mentions, oh, well, we took care of uh, the other variant, so you're good to go. It's only you now. And 
of course, Mobius picks up on the emotional reaction and realizes Loki cares about Sylvie. Yeah, this is and... what, yeah. This is when I was definitely like, oh, he definitely has like romantic feelings because them not even being the same like <clears throat> character. If she was someone completely other than Loki, and she had, and he had the same reaction, you would one hundred percent read it as romantic. So I think that's mm-hmm. when it was kind of confirmed for me that it's definitely like a romantic kind of a feeling. Yeah, and I think it's interesting too that mobius uses that play of like oh we took care of her and that's enough to get the name sylvie out of loki and <laughs> mobius kind of really confidently writes it down and gets the name out of him and it's like oh he had that interrogation to make down you know he got something out of loki for the first time in this whole series probably yeah and that's when loki fills him in on the whole story he says you guys are all variants sylvie showed me a vision she filled me in and Everybody here at the TVA were people on the timeline who were stolen off of it and had their minds wiped and turned into an agent. Mobius doesn't quite buy it yet. He he wants to buy it. He wants to believe Loki, but of course, it's Loki. You know, Loki cried wolf one too many times, and he didn't buy him this time. So he throws him right back in again to Lady Sis prison. <laughs> oh, that would be rough. Just getting kicked in the <laughs> face and just everywhere for like 10 to 15 seconds would be... I know, and you every time it finishes, you're like, okay, please, next time it's good. Next time I'll talk my way out of it. You know, uh, yeah. I'm gonna do it, and then you try one other way, and once again, you beat up. I wonder how that <laughs> works, though, because like, okay, in his mind, he's on Asgard, so could he use his powers, or because technically he's still in the TVA, he doesn't have his powers. I, I want to know how that works. And what happens if he just like runs? You know, <laughs> can yeah. he just like run faster and leave or something? No. Yeah. But who knows the logic of these time prisons, Joe? Meanwhile, back at the TVA, Sylvie is working her magic on C-15. Uh, another one of the soldiers who's kind of mm-hmm. picking up that something ain't going right yeah. here. Uh, she was kind of close to C-20, and when C-20 had her mind wiped, C-15 was also possessed, but didn't quite get the same level of mind melding. So mm-hmm. she's reunited with Sylvie. She brings her all the way back out to the the uh, Rocks Co., I think it's called, the, service, the shopping center they go to in the previous episode, and to hide in an apocalyptic event and says, show me what you showed me last time. I need to know the truth. And Silly puts her hand up to her, touches her, her side of her head and shows her the truth that she and everybody else at the TVA are variants. And she has this kind of powerful moment where she's crying and kind of says like, oh, I look happy and realized she had a whole life to herself that she totally and completely forgot about. Yep. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's gotta be rough to be like, oh yeah, all your memory's gone. That blows. Yeah, and, and you realize, like, oh, all these really significant moments I experienced are just gone. <laughs> and, like, you know they're there. You know that they happened. But... Yep. Dust in and the of wind, course, man. It's all we are. It's dust in the wind. And when you look at it, too, from, like, the religious perspective, the, the people believe in the TVA and the timekeepers the same way you believe in any, like, large-scale cult or something like yeah. that. And the fact that what the whole thing they built their beliefs around is just being completely torn up in front of them and shown to be a lie speaking of someone figuring out that everything they've been told is a lie Joe we're reunited with Mobius once again uh, he's here with Renslayer celebrating their victory they've captured the two variant Lokis their careers are saved they're having a couple of drinks to, to keep it keep it going but it's not quite like it was uh, Mobius still has that little tease in the back of his head telling him something's not right so he's pushing Renslayer asking her about C20 asking her about Sylvie why he wouldn't why he couldn't see silly why he couldn't talk to c20 and he's just noticing something's up brent slayer tries to manipulate him a bit and says oh i didn't want you to talk to sylvie to protect you because i care too much about you and you can see it in in her eyes that she's just saying that to try and turn it around on him like sort of trying to yeah. make it oh i care so much about you that's why i didn't she's trying all the all the paths to mobius's heart but he's not buying it joe he switches her trans receiver with his and is ready to run out with her receiver and get some information. What do you think of this scene with Renslayer and Mobius? Yeah, it's kind of the number one scene of this chick fucking sucks. And, like, she's definitely lying. She definitely knows some shit. I'm curious how much is her knowing shit and how much is her just being ultra brainwashed and all of that. Mm-hmm. Maybe, like, implanted memories and that kind of thing. It'll be curious to find out. But, yeah, definitely uh, I like the scene of him switching out their little pads to figure out what he knows and only to find like we see in a little bit in the future that she was completely fine she just had no knew too much and so that's why she got cut mm-hmm. 
This is the scene where I started getting nervous for Mobius because I thought, oh, Mobius, you're getting too big for your yeah. britches here. You're yeah. starting to really take on the take on the big guys here, and we're getting to the point of the arc where, oh, there could be a major death. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Mobius is getting too much yeah. information too fast. It doesn't seem too good for his health here. Yeah. Icarus flying a little too close to the sun. <laughs> yeah, but Mobius heads out of the office, and Renslayer is immediately suspicious. He's all, you're leaving so soon, and he says... Oh yeah, you know, I've had a drink or two and she this is where we get that setup that she asks him like, Oh, if you could be anywhere on the timeline doing anything you wanted, what would you be doing? And Mobius doesn't really give an answer. He says, Oh, I just I'd like to be in here, I like doing the work with you, I like just being me. You know, he's content being Mobius. But there's this little net thing nigging at him, and then of course uh he heads out of the room and looks at the looks at the transponder and watches a video where B twenty's being interrogated and says I'm a variant, you're a variant, everybody's a variant, and I'm going to tell everybody. And of course, uh, she gets shut down. <laughs> yeah. And Renslayer knew about it the whole time. Yeah, Any thoughts on that, on that, Joe? Yeah, it kind of sucks for him. You know, it's like basically like signed her own death warrant. He had to knew, know what was coming at that point. Like, going against the top people being like, y'all suck. So, kind of the end of him for that. Yeah, and I think that's almost a moment of desperation because this is a point where he shows up and rescues Loki once again from the time prison. You know, Loki's there, he's frustrated. He's like, oh, I get it, I get it. You're going to beat me up. You're going to say this and that. And yep. it's not Sif this time, it's Mobius. And Mobius pulls him out, and then they get kind of like an all cards on the table kind of play right here. And Mobius says, look, Loki, was she lying? Tell me the truth. I need to know what's happening here. And Loki says, look, I told you the truth. Sylvie showed all his memories, and you guys are all variants and Mobius kind of has this come around where him and Loki are finally on the same side, finally fighting for the same cause, and they have this this heart-touching exchange where Mobius says, you can be anything you want to be, even if you want to be a good guy, just in case anybody ever told you differently. You know, And it kind of warms Loki's heart a bit. Like He spent this whole show thinking of himself as destined to be the villain, destined to be the failure, destined to be the one that's there to be fought against. Even Mobius told him that himself. And now they get this moment where Mobius comforts him and says, you know what, Loki, you can be anybody that you want to be. Don't follow these TVA rules. Don't think that you have to be one thing that you're not. You can be anything. And I like that for what could be their final scene together in the show. Yeah, I think he's coming back. I don't think they're going like that before you can ride a jet ski. That motherfucker's riding a jet ski before the final credits roll. I don't, I'll even say post credit scene. <laughs> by the time like, it says, by the time Disney Plus asked me, "Would you like to watch probably Falcon and Winter Soldier, one of the Thor movies?" I'm gonna see goddamn Owen Wilson riding a jet ski. Look, I sure hope so because I would love to see more Owen Wilson. I think him and Loki's dynamic was easily the most interesting part of this whole show so far, and I would hate to see it end. And this scene, I think, is a really great culmination of all the different. In- uh, conversations. I think if you go back and watch like only the Loki Mobius scenes of the show, you get a really great character growth dynamic of these two people. Yeah. But yeah, like you mentioned, this could be the end for Mobius because they walk out all confident out the portal, ready to go get Sylvie and find some answers. But Renslayer's onto him. She's standing there right outside the portal, little uh, erasure beam thing in hand, surrounded by soldiers, and they they just kind of confront Mobius. She says, oh, I think he has something that belongs to me. And Mobius tries to give one last lie that I can't think he even believed was going to happen. But he says, oh, you yeah, know, I got all the way down here and I accidentally realized I swooped, swapped mine with yours. <laughs> yeah. And of course that didn't work. Yeah. But uh, Mobius gives one last final goodbye. Uh, Renslayer is about to, to disappear him. And he says, you know what? If I could really be anywhere that I wanted to be, I'd be in my real life, the one you guys stole from me, the one the TVA took from me, and I'd be riding a jet ski. That's <laughs> what I want to do. And then he gets zapped away into non-existence and breaks Loki's heart in front of him. Or did he get zapped into non-existence? That's my little <laughs> take. Look, I mean, I... True death or not, I bought into like the emotion of this scene because like whether or not he comes back or not, I feel like in that moment, like he's he thinks he's dying, Loki thinks he's dying, Renslayer thinks she's killing him. So like the character it all works for the characters yeah. in that moment. <laughs> you know, so it worked for me. And I was really invested in the Loki Mobius relationship, so I really felt that when he died and I really thought his final goodbye 
whether it's his final goodbye or not, it did feel like kind of a goodbye. Like he was able yeah. to give a, a final speech or two before he went out. So I think that added some legitimacy to it. Like when a character, like when Loki dies later in the episode with very little fanfare, I'm I'm thinking, okay, well, obviously he's coming back. But there was enough fanfare here where I thought, like, maybe not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Even if they kill Loki, I expect him to come back in goddamn Thor 4. Like... <laughs> Yeah, and I imagine Owen Wilson will want to keep up with this character, keep those paychecks rolling in. You know, maybe show up in that man or show up in some other thing. Yeah, <laughs> that would be my that'd be the the goal for me with if I was Owen Wilson. I'd be like, okay, I get those Loki checks, and I gotta have a, like a small role here in, in Ant Man in the Quantum Realm or whatever it's called, and get Quantum those. Quantum Mania. And... Yep. Just a dumb uh, title, but whatever. but yeah, I'd hope to see more Mobius, and I'd be shocked if we didn't see more Mobius, but. Yeah. It's not over yet, folks. We got one major death, but the episode still has about 15 minutes left in it or so, 10 minutes or so. And so Loki and Sylvie reunite. Uh, Sylvie is taken up by the TVA, but they show up and she's there covered in rain and they're like, what happened to her? And they say, oh, B-15 was out there with her. And they realize that B-15's also gone rogue. They're losing agents pretty quick here. But they bring Loki and Sylvie up to the timekeepers because for some reason the timekeepers want to oversee their erasure themselves so moby or uh renslayer takes loki and sylvie up to the timekeeper's lair where look i don't know where to pause here because it just never really stops but loki and sylvie yeah, fine. confront the timekeepers and they are going to be erased but of course b15 shows up and kind of is like a timely rescue for them and they get this really cool action sequence where they all kind of fight the timekeeper guards. Clearly, whoever wrote Loki had a good time watching Last Jedi. Yeah. Because it's they a give great us movie. a nice Last Jedi finale here. Uh, even got the Raylo vibes from like the Star Cross Lovers type yep. thing where they're fighting for their lives against these impossible odds. And then, of course, not only that, but they defeat all of the soldiers and uh, the timekeepers kind of start taunting them. and. Sylvie's not here, none of it. She throws her spear, cuts off the middle timekeeper's head. Perfect Snoke move, you know. Says, "Oh, I'm not doing any of your plot. You're you're, you're talking about your story. I'm throwing that spear towards you. I'm cutting your head off. Oh, it's a robot. They're not even the really robots. aliens, Joe. They're robots. The robots. All of them are robots. robots. They start giving some robotic laughter, and they kind of just go and die. I'll pause it there, Joe. We got a lot of timekeeper uh, reveals in that moment there. Yeah, timekeepers are all bullshit. That's what we learned. Timekeepers <laughs> are bullshit. We even get a line from Loki where he says, they're robots, then who created the TVA? <laughs> and it's like, well, at least we're all on the same page, Loki. Yep. Kang the motherfucking conqueror. That's <laughs> I love this reveal. I think, like, we all knew the timekeepers were going to be some kind of foil for some, something else and it was going to be peeled back. But I think they did it pretty effectively. I wouldn't have guessed that they were literally like robots <laughs> and they're going to cut out their robot head and i like i didn't expect it to come down in this exact way so what, even though i kind of knew they're going to pull it back on the timekeepers i thought it was a really effective and this whole action sequence this whole entire fight here was pretty effective and then to have that all culminate and the reveal that they're robots i thought that was a really good way to reveal it and i still don't really know where they're going to go with it from here yeah, me either. I don't really know what the fuck's going on. I kind of want to see King the Conqueror in this, but there's been, like, no mention of him whatsoever, so I don't know if it's just going to be, like, R- Ravana Renslayer is going to be kind of the main big villain of the last two episodes, and that's who they got to take out, or what the fuck's going to happen. I just want to know when it's going to be confirmed that Andrew Garfield Spider-Man and Tobey Maguire <laughs> Spider-Man are goddamn variants. That's what I want. Yeah, I mean, I was wondering when I saw the episode, and they've been playing coy with Spider-Man for so long. If they were maybe trying to hold this, hold that trailer back until they can get as much out of the show as they could, like, because clearly by the end, I I imagine we're in the multiverse at this point, and uh, we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, I I think that's what we're gonna get here, and I'm excited for it. But yeah, I love this this whole sequence here. One of my favorite sequences of the show so far. Maybe my favorite sequence of the whole of these MCU shows. I think this is a really kind of effective, perfect amount of cheese with with some good action, some really cool stage work, and I just had a good time watching it. But, of course, uh, Loki and Sylvie are about to have this heart-to-heart conversation. Loki kind of takes her by the shoulder and says, this is 
new for me, but I've got something to say to you, Sylvie. And then, inconveniently, Loki is zapped by Renslayer, who is still alive, just somehow not uh somehow not unconscious or whatever you know she just stands up and she she zaps loki down and zoki has now been erased from the timeline sylvie of course is not having it she knocks Renslayer back on her ass puts the spear over her head and says tell me everything and that's the end of our episode until we get of course to the post credit scene but yeah. i have my is Renslayer what... gonna tell her everything uh i don't think so <laughs> I feel like some shit's about to go down. I do have my theory on what Loki was going to tell Sylvie, and that's that he had the Force. Just like... Oh, that's what it was. Yep. He had the Force. It's obvious if you pay attention to the movie, guys. <laughs> All the Star Wars connections were on purpose. It was perfectly designed to Episode Nine to, to get that little mind connection. Yeah, all of Loki really exists so that they can kind of recontextualize the sequel trilogy and make us like it's good, actually. Yep, it is good. Yeah, we got our our last Jedi tribute here. We got our Rise of Skywalker tribute by the end. But yeah, and we I had think... the Force Awakens tribute in the beginning with young Sylvie being played by the actress right. that played young Ray. It's all coming together, Joe. It's like poetry. It rhymes. Yep, Jar Jar is the key to all of this. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, maybe Renslayer is the key to all of this, Joe. I don't know how much she knows. I think she's a middle manager type person. I don't think she knows yeah. a ton. Yeah. But I imagine she knows more than Sylvie, and I think she'll be able to give Sylvie a bit of context of where Loki's at, what this eraser thing actually does, because obviously it doesn't actually kill them, or at least doesn't kill Loki. And I imagine it'd be consistent with all the characters. <laughs> but yeah. Do you think there's a way, like, maybe she knows everything, but she's almost like a sympathetic villain in a way? Like, if we do see Kang the Conqueror, maybe we find out that Renslayer promised her, like, if you help me take out all of these other variants, I'll restore you to your proper timeline, and I'll restore your timeline, and I'll make sure your timeline is one of the other timeline or something like that, where it's like, hey, if you work for me, everything you know that I destroyed, I'll bring back. Yeah, because Loki told us no one good is ever really good, no one bad is ever really bad, so I don't think this is the show to give us, oh, Renslayer is just bad, you know? I think they'll give us at least some sympathy. And for me, I think sympathy can come in if she's a firm, if she believed in the timekeepers, if she really bought into the fact that these things are real and they were telling you real information. And like, if you're being told that there's a sacred timeline to keep order to the yeah. literal existence of all the universe, like, I think you're just going to do yeah. what they tell you to do, you know? And you might have some questions, but there's a, there's a really powerful moment where after she zaps Mobius away, she's having this sort of like doubt in her head what she's doing. And she kind of like looks up almost like in prayer like this reminder of like i'm doing this for a higher purpose not just because yeah. it hurts me i'm doing this because it's for the betterment of literally all of existence yeah. across all of the universe <laughs> she's like we can't allow spider-man 3 to happen i know she's like no we cannot spider-man we 3, need to reboot spider-man amazing again. spider-man 1 and 2 are bad we need to make sure these don't happen we need to remove these variants <laughs> look take me to the alternate universe where we just got sam Raimi's spider-man 4 and we kept going yeah but yeah, we skipped through the credits, uh, and then for the first time in the series history, now we've gotten our Loki post-credit scene. Yeah, usually, Loki... yeah, for the for uh, Wandavision and Falcon and Winter Soldier, we got post-credit scenes for the final two episodes. But I guess we're getting post-credit scenes for the final three for this show. Yeah, I like it. I think that that's a good post-credit scene too, where Loki wakes up in sort of this destroyed New York City. And we don't know exactly what happened, but we hear a voice. Loki kind of talks to himself and says, oh, am I in hell? And, of course, if you watch subtitles for a nice little note, it's H-E-L, the mm -hmm. spelling you would have gotten in the mythology. <laughs> and they say, oh, there's a voice comes off from the screen, and it says, uh, oh, you're not, you're not dead yet, but you will be if you don't come with us. And we get a reverse shot, a little bit of an Avengers Q hits, and there's a whole squad of Lokis. We got our kid Loki. We got our uh crocodile loki <laughs> probably the most interesting of the lokis we've also yeah. got the one they credit as boastful loki he's a a black man with a big thor hammer uh so i'm curious to see how he's gonna play in i don't know anything about any of these characters in the comics other than I, I know, kid loki being a character i know a little bit so richard e grant who again in the last or in the rise of skywalker so further <laughs> rise of star wars connections uh richard e grant he's more he was kind of in like the OG Loki costume. He's very much more villainous, very much more uh, ruthless kind of character. 
boastful Loki, Loki, brand new character, not in the comics really at all. And then Kid Loki, kind of tying into what we think has been building up for a while, is kind of part of the whole Young Avengers thing in the Marvel comics. So with uh, what we potentially might have with Patriot from Captain America, or, or Falcon and Winter Soldier, and then uh, Kate Bishop... Uh, Haley Steinfeld's character in the Hawkeye series and some other characters that have been kind of popping up and characters that we know are going to pop up he might be a fairly prominent character moving forward or he could just be in that post credit scene who knows yeah I think at least uh, Richard Grant is going to be around for the rest of the show because he's he was kind of cast into the series I think I think so so I imagine these three at least a couple of these characters will stick yeah. around for the next couple episodes and yeah. I, just want- I imagine I just want Florida or Loki two, to start like... biting people. You know, I don't know if that's yeah, the name. I, I like the name Florida Loki. <laughs> Florida Loki's good. I think I'm gonna go with that. Yeah, I, th- I will. I hope Florida Loki like talks. You know, I want like a uh, like, like an alligator voice. Thing? Yeah. Uh, who, and he who'd be a good voice? About... Who'd be a good voice for that? Oh God, just like a, a good nice Southern. Just see, I was thinking like a. Uh... What's that guy? He was in the Shield. He was in Walton Goggins. I think Walton wow. Goggins would be a good. Yeah. Florida Loki. Yeah, he's got it. that that voice for it. Woody Matthew Harrelson. McConaughey, Woody Harrelson. Another Star Wars crossover. Yeah, yeah I think it's curious. I think it's interesting. I think like it looks to me, Joe, like you just for the first time saw the multiverse in the MCU. Like I think we're actually there. Yeah. Yeah. See, Which I want to know when Mobius got zapped. Did he go into his own Mobius world where he saw other Woody Harrelsons? Did he see Lightning McQueen? <laughs> Did he see Hansel from um, Zoolander? Did he see like all of his other characters he played? Like that would be amazing if we cut to Mobius in his own uh, thing, and it is like all of Owen Wilson. That would be so good. Like he's running away from some explosion or something. He's at his own apocalyptic event, and then like a car just grinds up and. You look up, it's a red race car. You're like, oh my god. He walks around. He's got the big eyes. He's like, ka yeah, Perfect. It'd be amazing. <laughs> look, if we free wrote Loki, it'd be so much better. All right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, a lot of theories to talk about. Uh, we kind of mentioned what we think is going to happen with these characters here. Uh, I do think that Kid Loki will probably be a prominent character. I imagine Richard E. Grant is around for like a couple episodes as like a special guest star they're not gonna keep yeah. him around as like a main character well there's only but... the two episodes left anyway so that is true but I, might, I it sounds to me like we're getting a second season out of this one yeah do you think uh, it'll I, be I think... TVA focused or do you think they'll do like something completely different I, I hope it's something completely different I hope it's I hope it's Loki and Sylvie or whoever's left by the end of the episode just kind of bouncing around doing sci-fi antics yeah <laughs> or like some larger scale villain of course but I I think the biggest flaw we'll have by the end of this series here is that they spent a lot of time with the TVA and not a lot of time universe hopping, which I thought was like the premise of the show. Like, oh, we're going to see all these alternate Lokis and it's going to be kind of like this round throughout the multiverse and it hasn't really been that. So um, I would hope season two maybe is a bit more of that now that the whole layer is pulled off and we know the multiverse is real. Yeah, like the whole D.B. Cooper thing, which was in the trailer and kind of how they originally pitched the show to like fans... I for sure thought like the whole D.B. Cooper thing would be like an episode of the show and not just mm-hmm. like, this one off random scene. That's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, we'll get the D.B. Cooper episode. We'll get the Loki for president episode where he's running for president in some universe. We'll get like, you know, our comic book cheesy weird Loki uh, episode, but they didn't go for that at all. Yeah, they're just like, oh, he's like here, I guess. It's a cap show. That's <laughs> Loki. Loki Look, cats. I've had a great time with it. I think it's interesting because they did they did not what we expected, but they yeah. still delivered a lot. Yeah. yeah, it's been good. I really like it so far. I just not. Yeah. And I'm really interested to see what they do with this timekeeper thing. I want to get more into what the timekeeper revelation is going to be because I think it's re- I think it's refreshing and kind of comforting this episode because we got Loki that moment where Loki pulls off the head and he's like, "Well, then who's running the TVA?" And I think it's kind of a comfort that we're at least looking in the right place to so ask the right questions because. Yeah. By the sound of WandaVision, I think we all got to the point where we're like, oh, they're probably not doing Where's this. Or they're probably not doing this now? or this. Because <laughs> we all started to kind of give up hope by the end because we're like, oh, they're just doing the Agatha. And that's pretty much it. And it was Agatha if they all along, man. If we got to this episode and they were like, oh, it's just the timekeepers. That's just all there is. I think it'd be a disappointment. But the fact that they pulled that back and said, oh, there's some kind of bigger thing, I think is 
yeah. exciting. Whether it's Kang, uh, I do have what my if own it is, theory. What if Mephisto was the creator of the TVA and they're like, oh, we got you good, <laughs> boys. That would be actually hilarious. I would love that. Ralph Bowman. It'd be, it'd be good too because they could go, they could like retcon that into happening. They could go into like season two of Loki and be like, oh, it was Mephisto the whole time. We were planning it with the WandaVision guys. You were right. And of course, let's pull like a Star Wars thing. Be like, oh, we, oh yeah, that's, that was better the whole time. You know? It's Ralph Boner. <laughs> Can you imagine Ralph Boner's the time computer? He was keeping an eye on on, uh, on Wanda the whole time. I, I could see it. I'm for it. I have a tiny theory of my own, Joe. What's your theory? That I think the timekeepers are not going to answer into Kang. I think we're going to get a we're going to get a reveal in the end of the series here that uh, people who are actually in charge of the TVA, or now the TVA is deceased, maybe is someone that'll take over and be the one trying to keep order once again is going to be the Watcher. I think we've seen teases of the Watcher in the Guardians of the Galaxy, but didn't and we, we know isn't that kind of too late for that because didn't we see that the Watcher is Stanley? We know that a watcher is Stanley, but we also know that Marvel has a What If series coming out where there's a watcher in that show played by a totally different actor, played by the guy from Westworld and uh, Hunger Games. Uh, the, you're you're naming two name things I haven't watched. So <laughs> Stanley too. Yeah, I'll, I'll look it up while I'm talking. But yeah, Ed I Harris. think that we could James get James Marsden. Thing. It's uh, it's uh, Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey Wright's playing oh, the Watcher. Why didn't you just what tell me show. it's Commissioner Gordon in the bat- new Batman movie? Oh, you're right. He is Commissioner Gordon in the new Batman, but that's not canon to the real DCEU, Joe. Anyway, uh, okay. <laughs> I do think they could pull that back. It's a, it's my wild theory is that we're gonna get a Timekeeper or uh, uh, a Watcher, and by the end of this series, and it'll be a little bit of a setup to t- kind of make the Marvel What If show, which comes out after Loki feel more important because i i wonder how they're going to get people to watch that animated show and i think if you get a even just an appearance of a watcher in this show and you get an idea like oh there's this multiverse out there that the watcher keeps yeah. control over yeah i could see that I, I i also know how the uh what's the one the the captain america one uh peggy carter how that show is going to start because it's what if peggy carter became captain america and i know this is really off topic at this point but in Captain America the First Adventure when Tommy Lee Jones throws the grenade to prove that Chris Evans car- Chris Evans ca- you know uh Cap- Steve Rogers doesn't have what it takes to be Captain America Steve as Steve Rogers runs toward the grenade you can see in the background that Peggy Carter was running towards it too so I think that's how it's going to start is Tommy Lee Jones is going to throw the grenade and for whatever reason Steve Rogers isn't there or doesn't get to it in time and Peggy Carter beats him and she jumps on the grenade and then it turns out to be a fake grenade, and then they realize, oh, this woman should be Captain America. But back on time. I am curious how much that show, like, are they going to try and play out that show as, like, an actual thing within the canon of the universe, or is it just, like, going to be these random things? <laughs> because they've introduced the idea that there are variants and there are these moments where one thing goes differently and the whole universe changes. So I wonder if they could work that into a canon of the MCU. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they could by what you're saying with the Watcher and being having it be part of the multiverse, I guess. But, um, I do think Kang is probably a a solid bet, though. We've got Renslayer who sets that up. We know Kang is in a why, future movie. Why would you pick like of all the judges of the TVA? Like, why would you pick the one that's like married to the guy that's going to be in Ant Man? That's confirmed to be in Ant Man if it's, he's not connected. Yeah, and I I imagine the best direction is probably to throw him into a post credit scene like make Renslayer the main bad of this next two episodes or whatever it is and then our post credit scene is her in some way similar to Loki in the first Avengers like going up to Loki goes to Thanos and says oh I kind of failed our mission and Thanos is is there and you get the reveal that Thanos is the next big bad of the whole universe and you can get that here yeah like Renslayer think- goes and says oh I messed up I didn't catch a Loki I didn't do this or that and you get a turn around and it's a CG blue guy and you're like oh it's Kang there he is I, I see it more as they beat Renslayer they think they beat the bad guy they think they won they did everything and then you cut to Kang the Conqueror as your post credit scene being like oh they think they won they haven't won anything blah 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 that could be good I think if you're having a second season too you could do a cliffhanger you could have them all think they won and then Kang shows up and just kind of zaps them all to hell or something you know like yeah they beat they beat Renslayer and Kang just pulls another variant Renslayer for a post-credit scene. It's like, how oh, you think you won? You didn't win. 
new venue. Yeah, I hope we get a season two because we got two episodes left, and I'm having a blast with this season, yeah. Joe. I, do you have any other theories or anything else to talk about? Because a lot kind of happened this episode, and I we had a lot to Not cover really. on it's here. It's kind of hard because it's like we've kind of caught up to the characters as far as question wise because the characters are asking all the same things we are, so it's kind of hard to be like oh this is what's gonna happen in the future because there are things that like we have theories on that they could fully leave unanswered like why was sylvie taken like i don't necessarily think we like they can i we can have a satisfying final two episodes for the show and then just not answer that question and i think the big question is like where is loki like what what happened to loki because <laughs> yeah. we were told that these things erased you from existence so the fact that he was erased and then woke up in what we see to be a destroyed New York City, I I just want to know the context of what that is, and yep. I'm sure that's like it'll be like a one line thing, like oh you, what you actually do is get sent to some alternate universe. Now you're waking up in some variant timeline or something like yeah. that. And <laughs> but I'm curious, like those are the questions where it's like they could just have it be a one line thing, or it could be like the the part of next week, you know? Yeah. And I will say, we in the, if the trailers are to be believed, we've seen. Uh, See with Mobius in the trailers that has not yet been in the series. <laughs> so mm -hmm. unless that was a cut scene, I I think it's pretty confirmed that Mobius does come back yeah. within the next two episodes. Yeah, I think he's coming back within the first half of the next episode. That's my theory. I think the most tragic way to bring him back is that Loki and Sylvia are in, in some predicament, and Mobius has been res Mobius is back and has been trying to get back to them all episode and then has to sacrifice himself to save them without them even knowing it. So Loki doesn't even get to know that Mobius was yeah. alive and saved him. Mobius to Loki, Mobius still died in the TVA. Yep. Yeah, I can see that. But we'll see. I have no clue what to expect next week. <laughs> uh they threw me for kind of a loop. Not a loop this week, but it's it's like you said, it's nice to know we're asking the same questions at the characters are asking we're not on some crazy tangent that isn't going to be relevant at all they at least have an answer for what we're trying to get get answered yep if we've got if you've covered everything we got for loki nice hour-long talk on loki there but i think it was a, a heavy episode a thick one yeah yeah a lot going on on that episode not as much for what we're going to talk about <laughs> next i mean it was still good i enjoyed it but uh yeah i'm down to talk bad batch episode 10 the common ground if you are i'm down for that I don't know right. why, but I put down Bad Batch episode 73. It's definitely not episode 73. Well, We're not there yet. I hope we get to that point. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait for that Bad Batch lineup. We're going to have Wreckers leading the team with Echo and uh, Omega. And then by that point, Boba's going to have joined the group. And then we're going to bring back um, Commander Cody is going to be reformed. And he's part of the group now. And yeah, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, uh, for, uh, we are not that far along yet, Joe. We're only in season one. Oh, okay, season uh, one, episode ten, Common Ground. Season one, episode ten, Common Ground. They're trying to find Common Ground with Separatists in this episode because uh, the Empire is holding a Separatist senator against his will. I think I believe his name Can is I... Senator Sting. It's Avi King, Avi Kring, something like that. I don't know, but I want I want to file a complaint. About, I don't know. About We're early name. on already, Joe. He's about already the complaining name about the, the character. Episode about the name of the character <laughs> so I, I i don't know what your thoughts are but like normally when like white characters are in star wars they get cool fucking names like luke skywalker and han solo and like this and then they they wanted to bring like i was kind of like an indian type character indian as in like the country uh character in but like he doesn't get a cool name they're like hey we brought you in because we want to represent like that so you still have to have a name of like an Indian sounding person. Like, why can't he get a cool Star Wars <laughs> name? That's what. That's my thing. Like, you That'd can bring nice him in and bring in like, okay, you have an Indian visual style, and maybe your name has like Indian influence. But his name, I, I feel like I could go to India and find a guy with that name. <laughs> Look, you got a couple people who are non-white that have cool names. Bail Organa is a pretty cool name. Yeah. That's probably the only. You got a Mace Windu. That's a but nice. But like Organa nice was kind Star of given name. to him for a last name. He didn't really have a choice. I mean, he came into it with a last name, so. That's true. Look, uh, but he is a senator, so maybe the senators are given boring names because they're yeah. the boring characters, and the that's separatists true. are also the bad guys. That's true. Uh, <laughs> that was just my thought. As soon as they heard his name, I'm like, that's kind of like a. I don't know, I feel like he could have got a cool space name. To me, so. as soon as I saw him, I thought, that looks like a guy who definitely died on Hosnian Prime. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> that guy looks like a fucking, like, I don't know. It looked like a Mr. Monopoly, but different. 
<laughs> yeah, I liked I liked his weird looking. He had like he had like also, a Mr. Monopoly look to him. But also not a complaint for this, but a complaint for the Clone Wars. I would have liked to see more characters like this in the Clone Wars of not necessarily like villains, but characters like on the other side that they were working against that were separatists that were like not just like I'm a weird fucking spider guy or I'm a weird robot guy like but like oh, that's a that's just a guy with different beliefs <laughs> than me you know but he's normal yeah uh, we get that here like this whole episode is pretty much about like the bad batch who are loyal to the republic still in their minds and then like this guy's a separatist and he's supposed to be the bad guy but he's not as bad as you think and that's sort of the premise here. There's a separatist senator who is held kind of against his will by the Empire, and he's going to be forced to give a speech to his people who are getting really rebellious and don't want to concede to the Empire. And he, they want him to calm the citizens down because they're afraid they're going to inspire some rebellious activity, and he wouldn't want any rebellion in the Empire. But uh, the senator has a crisis of conscience and kind of refuses to give that speech, and now it's up to the Bad Batch to rescue this guy out of prison and Sid hires him on to do that. That's kind of just the premise yeah. of the episode. Yeah, I will say this is, the, I think, the first episode in a while where we don't have a character that was from, like, previous Star Wars stuff. Like, he was not in any episodes of the Clone Wars. I was fearful of that because there was a moment where they were, like, looking for the contact, and I didn't realize it would just be, like, his assistant droid. I thought they would have, like, an actual contact, and I'm like, is it going to be, like, Saw Gerrera? Like... What, what are we doing here and then it was just his droid and i'm like oh shoot i think we're actually gonna like just not get a character returning for the first time we do get a, a a planet returning though oh eh, i don't count that though <laughs> we've seen rex a handful of times in the star wars canon <laughs> yeah, uh, i mean that's fine i just like... most prominently i think it's known for being the capital of the separatist uh republic or yeah. the, what do you would call them the confederacy <laughs> yeah. the separatist confederacy the people who were rebelling against the republic in the in the clone wars this was the capital planet for them it's also the origin planet of dooku where dooku was trained to be uh, a jedi uh he was found on this planet uh he learned about that in jedi lost the dooku novel yeah uh, there's I a couple of that. good dooku prequels that are really good if you're wanting to expand your uh, your understanding of the Clone Wars, the Separatists, and all that kind of era of Star Wars, I definitely recommend uh, both. The, there's an Obi-Wan and Anakin book that gets a lot into their their past, and then there's also a Dooku Jedi Lost that's like a radio drama type thing that goes through Dooku's origin, his, yeah. his, Apparently his training the, uh, to becoming a, a Jedi. The Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan good master, or Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan book is actually fairly good. I've heard uh, Master and Apprentice. I like that one a lot too. That also got next to Rexus. So uh, if you want some more of this planet for some reason or another, <laughs> read yeah. both of those. Uh, now, uh, meanwhile, the Bad Batch are off on this mission, but they think Omega has a bit too much heat on her. She's a bit too overworked. They're deciding to give her a break. And uh, at the at the behest of Sid, they decide to leave her there. Uh, Hunter is not quite sure if he trusts Sid for a second or two, but <laughs> she strong arms him and says, look, you, you made a deal with me, you owe me, and... I can take care of the kid, and Hunter just leaves her there with with Sid. <laughs> I will say when uh, Sid first showed up, I thought this was going to be like a one or two episode character and voiced by Rio Perlman. And as a Cheers fan, I thought, oh, that's kind of fun. She's like my one of my favorite characters right now, Sid. Uh, she had a great line, and I can't even remember. Uh, oh, and Sid was saying something about like the history of the the confederacy of independent systems or something and she was just like thanks for the history lesson goggles i was like oh, i love <laughs> this character so much yeah i never expected sid to be a main character but at least for this first half of the season this has been kind of like their their base of operations you know yeah. they're their bad base all right okay. no more points <laughs> for you that was that was all all for you joe no more but yeah uh by the end of the episode too they're kind of paid off so i wonder if they're going to be heading out from this this yeah. bad base find a better base you know yeah because one of the things i always go back to when people are like oh why are they meeting all these characters it's like well Sid said in like one of the first few episodes you're going to need money and you're going to need friends and they were just acquiring friends and now they've acquired money so i i'm curious if this is going to be a big like jumping off and really i mean i know we're over halfway into the season but i feel like it's going to be a big like diving more into like the whole cloning aspect and what's the history of the clone and what's the history with omega and going more in that direction for the you know rest of this season yeah i'm curious what we'll get for the rest of the season because this is very much 
This is probably the first episode where it was truly like a standalone episode. Like I said, it didn't connect to any other characters. It didn't connect to much of anything. It was just, oh, the Bad Batch have a mission. Yeah. They're going out and they're doing the mission. Yeah. It was one of the ones where the A storyline didn't really connect, but the B storyline definitely, like... Mm -hmm. Like, I, I saw some complaint online of like, oh, this show sucks. Like, half the episodes are filler. And I'm like, what? What world? Are, to me, a filler episode is one where you could remove it while going on a watch through, and not real and like, and didn't even notice that you missed the episode. Like, and I hate the to episodes say of Rebels, but like for this episode, if if they're not working for Sid anymore, like you're gonna feel that, and especially with realizing like Omega has a knowledge for strategy, if she's like showing strategy and they're asking her for strategic opinions in the next episodes, you're gonna be like, wait, where the fuck did that come from? It's like, sure, the A storyline, you could completely cut it out and probably not miss anything. But the B storyline with Omega, I feel like is very important moving forward. Yeah, and I think filler is, like, more so a wasted time, in my opinion. Like, you can have an episode that doesn't further the plot necessarily. Like, this one doesn't further the plot, but I think it brings out some interesting conflicts. Like, uh, I mentioned here that they are looking for that contact, like you said, and they find out the contact is a droid. So you get another bit of a conflict here where the Bad Batch... Who yeah. still has hesitancy to work with droids has to work alongside this droid, not only a droid, but a separatist droid, like yeah. one that's working for a separatist senator. So I think, like, sure, it's a filler episode, they just go on like an adventure, but you get these little character moments, a little bit of a conflict where it's like, okay, here's a question what would it be like if the Bad Batch had to work with a separatist? And it's like, okay, let's do that for an episode. And yeah. uh, it's only filler if it's a waste of time. I didn't feel yeah. like I was yeah. wasting my time. So here. far, I haven't seen, there were a few episodes, there's a number of episodes of Clone Wars, a number of arcs of Clone Wars that are like, there are a few episodes of Rebels like that, but so far, I haven't gotten a vibe. And like all of Resistance is like that, but I haven't gotten any feeling from this show that of any time where i've been like this is filler this show episode yep. is filler we didn't need this episode and i'll get into that b plot right now because as the bad batch is going out getting ready for their mission here on Raxus, uh sid and omega are hanging out at the bar omega is not happy about the fact that she has to hang out here and do nothing yeah. no she's having a bit of a teen angst phase here with sid <laughs> they have a bit of a conflict and so or yeah one of i just want to bring up one of my favorite things i've noticed watch when i was watching this episode for the first time is because she doesn't have the enhanced aging she's most likely actually older than the bad batch so i thought that was just like a fun dynamic it's hard <laughs> to tell because it's hard to, because she's like 10 or 11 so i guess they seem older than like 22 23 but it's, it's hard to tell in animation and i feel like the clones have been like aged up where like sometimes like rex gives off the vibe that he's like 30 or 40 and it's like mathematically that doesn't make sense so i feel <laughs> like maybe they're not exactly double aged maybe it's like two and a half three times aged but double aged is just kind of like their way of saying it like oh yeah you just age faster you're double aged and it's like eh, really okay it's gonna be like two and a half three times yeah, I have a feeling that they age exactly as much as the plot needs them to be aged. <laughs> yeah, because it's like the clones should have, if if uh, if Boba is the very first clone at the, th in this point he's fourteen or fifteen years old, then the oldest any of the other clones can be is twenty eight and thirty. But the Bad Batch are one of the later clones made because of the fact the reason they're the Bad Batch is because it was denigrated DNA from, um. Django Fett because it was from after he died so at most the Bad Batch should be look 20 years old but and that's just like a dumb complaint because it's animated you can't really tell you could be like oh yeah they're, they're supposed to look 21 22 even though they all look 35 yeah and Crosshair definitely looks a lot older than like some of the other characters do but I don't know I think part of that's just like the the fact that they're the bad batch like they yeah. they you could argue like oh they they're well, flawed design at, uh, so their aging is off or something well you look at clone 99 who was all like fucked up and looked 90 years old even though mm -hmm. he's probably like 10 <laughs> poor guy they're like oh look at this he's this old guy yeah. <laughs> he can't do anything right <laughs> yeah because he i mean that's where they got clone force 99 was from clone 99 that was all like fucked up yeah and even even clone 99 was a hero by the end you know, he got a medal in that one episode yeah. didn't he yeah, I think so. I don't know. He blew himself up. Oh, he... that's right. I don't remember. Oh, we're in the Bad Batch now, though, Joe. And the Bad Batch is, like I said, they're on Raxus, and they've been led into Empire territory. This uh, bot serving the Separatists, this, dro this uh, droid, I'm sorry, not a robot. Robots don't exist in Star Wars, just droids. 
Uh, they say robot from time to time. <laughs> so the droid leads him into Empire territory, and Wrecker is not really trusting it. He's saying, like, what are you doing? You're leading us into this Empire zone. It's clear that the Bad Batch still isn't quite used to working with droids. Uh, so they decide to throw the droid into the line of enemy fire to use him as bait. Yep. <laughs> so they send the droid out, walking into the into the line here. The droid gives a little CPPO line of, like, oh, my word, or something like that, and turns around and runs away. And it's enough to bait the stormtroopers around the corner, and the bad bats take down the, the clones, the other clones, I guess, whatever these bad guys are. They're still clones at this point, I think. Uh, yeah, they're mostly clones. There's a few stormtroopers mixed in, I assume, based on earlier storylines in the show. But yeah, I, I like it's good Star Wars comedy fun moment. If it's in Star Wars, is weird about it the way it treats droids sometimes, you know. <laughs> It's kind of how they identify good guys from bad guys for the most part of good guys will treat the droids like human beings and villains and bad guys treat them like equipment and machinery. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of how they show um, people that ride the middle like the Bad Batch who Mm -hmm. will occasionally treat them good but occasionally treat them not so great. Yeah, and it's not like they put them in real danger. They didn't... Like, of course, they could have started shooting at them but you could argue like, oh, they... They knew they were going to chase him. <laughs> you know, it was enough danger that it's morally questionable, but not quite enough where you're like, oh, look at those assholes, like, torturing mm-hmm. a robot. <laughs> yeah. I still, The show needs a fucking droid. I'm saying that right now. The show... I agree. Season, like, season one finale, season two premiere, they need to get a droid. Gonky doesn't count. He's been in, like, two scenes in this show. Bring Gonky to the forefront. Give me some Gonky prominence here. I'm being robbed of my Gonky... Uh, scenes, you know, they sell toys of Gonky. Where's the Gonky action? Or BB one? They need a BB one, like a pre. Well, I guess no, because this is pre. I was thinking post. Yeah, so BB one wouldn't fit, but they need a droid. Maybe R. Uh, I don't know. They need a droid though. <laughs> R five sure from A New Hope would. can be their droid, and like they put him in all these situations that get him all fucked up, and that's why. He's, <laughs> I mean, technically in canon, he blows his motivator on purpose because R two D two is like, I need to get the fuck out of here, bro. If you don't, if if I'm stuck on this ship, then or if I'm stuck on this little container, then bad shit's gonna go down. So he blows his motivator. But maybe they can just treat him like shit, and then like that's why his motivator dies. I don't care. Yeah, we've seen that Omega can sabotage droids, so maybe she sabotages the motivator. You know, she it's planned all along. Yep. But uh. Something that was not planned all along was <laughs> the Bad Batch's plan here because clearly they don't really know what they're doing. They're in over their head, but they're sort of taking the stealthy way in. And uh, I can't remember which soldier it was. No, I think it was Hunter, but he goes and tries to give an order to Omega, who, of course, is oh, yeah. not there. And then I think it's uh, Tech that's like, yeah, uh, we could do that if Omega <laughs> was here, but she's not. Good Tech line. But yeah, I think it's supposed to hint to us here, like Omega is part of the team, and I yeah. think this idea of Omega hanging out doing kid stuff while the Bad Batch is out there doing all the adult stuff is not long for the show. I imagine pretty quickly she'll be out yeah, there you, with them, whether or not she's leading the, the finale, charge or not. Yeah, if you get to the finale of this episode, I, I think I know what, what goes down, whether they ever actually show it or they just like say what happened. <laughs> yeah, I have a curious theory of what uh, Omega's role is going to be. I'll get to that towards the end of the episode because there's more evidence that presents itself here in this episode. But we'll cut back here quickly to Omega and Sid, where Sid is here playing Space Monster Chess. I don't know what to call it. I, I know, chess. I'm sure there's a canon name for it. It's Hollow Chess. Not as cool. I like Space Monster Chess. Space Monster Chess. <laughs> Personally. Uh, but... Uh, Sid is not doing great. She's just playing against... Uh, we see these criminal guys hanging out here a couple of times. I don't know what their names are, but they're clearly like these Steve shady and Jim. dudes who that know. <laughs> Let's call them that. You know? I'll call them Johnny and Bobby. Right, Johnny and Bobby sounds... are hanging out there in the bar, yep. and uh, they're roasting Sid at this hollow chess game, and Omega comes in and says, oh, I watch Queen's Gambit. I can do that. And yep. She comes in and pulls a Queen's Gambit moment. She turns out she's actually great at hollow chess, and she destroys either Johnny or Bobby and they call in all their goons <laughs> so we get this kind of set up here that turns out Omega is actually really good at hollow, hollow chest her justification is that she knows strategy Yeah. and Sid presents the idea that maybe we should use it to our advantage and maybe you can win a couple credits out of it I, and, I feel like she, it's not necessarily that she knows strategy I think she's had a few late nights playing hollow chess with the Kaminoans I mean not that I mean she does know strategy but I don't feel like it's like oh I'm just good at strategy I'm can pick up on this game immediately. I feel like she's definitely 
she's played hollow chest before with the Kaminoans. Yeah, and I imagine the Bad Batch on their ship, they got a little hollow chest thing there. You know, the yeah. head of the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. So I, I think that's interesting, and I I want to remember that, that Omega's good at strategy, because I do think her role is going to be some kind of like I don't think they're gonna going to let you forget that. Forward. Yeah, they're going to keep reminding us of that. Just like they How kept times... reminding you that, hey, fucking Wrecker, when he hits his head, he gets a little wonky from time to time. <laughs> And they did that two or three times an episode <laughs> until they removed the chip in his head. And people have all been trying to think, like, what is Omega's role here? What makes her unique? Is she force sensitive? Is she, th- is she this or that? And I think she's good at strategy, I guess, is another way of them r- repeating this idea. Like, oh, she has this empathy. She has this intuition. Like, she looked at uh, uh, the Cody, I th- or no, Rex, and Rex's face and saw all, like, the wrinkles and was like, oh, you're Gen 1. And she has that kind of no. natural intuition. So I think that's something they're very much hammering home for yeah. Omega. And that, I feel like some of it too isn't necessarily like, oh, she was designed to be that way. Like, I feel like people get wrapped in their heads of like, as far as trying to come up with theories of like, oh, like looking at the Bad Batch and all this, like, oh, like she's some master strategist. The Kamen Owens designed her to be like this strategist to help, you know, defeat the Empire. And it's like, or she could just be like naturally good at something. That's enough. That's a thought too. And I think the fact that she's like an assistant to the medical uh, person on Ka- on Camino yeah. could hint to the fact that she was maybe not designed for strategy, but designed for some kind of like maybe her brains enhanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, she's big brains, Omega. Well, they said she wasn't. I mean, that's one of the reasons they want her DNA is because she wasn't enhanced or altered, except mm-hmm. for the fact that they took out the Y chromosome, I guess. But yeah, because she's like a hundred percent natural pure DNA, so there's no force sensitivity, none of that. So what we're getting essentially like. Are we saying that Django Fett and Boba Fett are, are equally intuitive? Which would kind of make sense in my mind, I think. I mean, I think it's just, like, part of, like, she was a good shot. So, like, people like me were like, oh, maybe she has the ability to cross her. I think part of it is, like, let's not forget she has Django and fucking Boba Fett's DNA. And, like, they, mm-hmm. have, they have to be, like, certainly naturally good at shit. I mean, there's a reason they were, Django was chosen as the base for the clones. Like, because he's maybe fucking good at shit. And so, hey, guess what? The person that's a exact clone of him, just female, naturally good at shit. <laughs> There's a thought. I like it, though. We even talked in Loki about, like, people who are on similar origins going on different paths, and that could be something mm. they bring up here, like, uh, Boba Fett and, o- and Omega could bond on the fact that they have this mm. similar origin, and yet their lives have taken hugely mm. different trajectories. Yeah. Assuming Boba Fett shows up on the show, which would... I mean, it's Star Wars animated. It's hard. They've, they've I... named Jack Boba Fett. They've name dropped Boba Fett. I'm curious. They've name dropped Boba Fett. We've had Cad Bane, who Boba Fett's gotten scuffles with before. I think if they were going to bring in Boba Fett, it would have been while Cad Bane had captured her. But there could be a thing of they need the pure DNA. They give up on trying to get what's her faces. And then they go get Boba. And then that's how Boba comes into the show. I don't know. I just. I think Boba will be in this show, but I think it's more likely a season two than a season one at this point, but I could be wrong. I was convinced, Yeah, I'm not sure about I, season one. I was convinced after the season one premiere, the big bad of this show would be Darth Maul, and we're at season one, episode ten, and we haven't even got so much as a Crimson Dawn or Darth Maul reference, so... Yeah, I think we're we're trying to rush the show along just a little bit. Like, we, we know from the history of these animated shows that they take their time. You know, we didn't get Maul until, like, season four of Clone Wars, you know, and... Yeah. I think we are going to get Fett. We are going to get Maul. But we got to give them that space. You know, season one is going to be the Bad Batch versus Crosshair season. And I think season two, you bring in somebody new. And season three, somebody new. But season one, Crosshair's I, dead. Who do you bring in? You got to bring in the pure, unaltered Django. And that's Boba Fett. It's a season, that's, I could see that's Boba what I'm Fett. saying. It's filling a season two. I got it. You, you called it, Joe. I, I think you got it right there. Boom. I We're do think Fennec Shan could be a good uh, connection. At, like, we know that in Boba Fett, uh, Book of Boba Fett, they're both together. So I think it could be a way to, like, show them have this history at some point. Like, Boba Fett can show up and confront uh, confront her and try and get Omega back or something like that. Like, if we were able to get Fennec Shan and Boba Fett some history together, that could be something yeah. that it, it brought, gets brought up again in Book of Boba Fett later in the year. Yeah. yeah. All right, we got our action to the episode here coming up, Joe. Uh, the Bad Batch rescues the senator guy uh he's being kind of captured interrogated by this captain bragg i'm 
put a note in here that Captain Bragg is officially more present in the plot than supposedly new Imperial leader guy that we got brought up in the premiere episode. <laughs> oh, uh, Rampart? Where, yeah, where's Rampart at? There could have been a Rampart in this episode. I think that yeah. would have been a better move. If you, yeah. But at this point, I, I imagine they're not really... Rampart doesn't seem like he's going to be that big of a character. Like He's not going to be a They gave him a hot character. toy, damn it. I thought he was going to be like the main villain. I know, and now look at him. He's doing nothing. But yeah. Captain Bragg does not last long, though. She's taken down by the Bad Batch pretty quick, and Senator uh, Singh is rescued. And the Bad Batch takes this big armored vehicle and uh, commandeers it for their escape. So they're going down this city street and shooting cars getting in this kind of <laughs> shooting uh, stormtrooper cars i guess uh, uh getting in a battle and then they think they're cornered for a second and senator singh says oh shoot that wall shoot that floor and shows them into a secret passage that gets them the chance to escape uh they flee out into this kind of giant gorgeous sun setting forest that i thought was really really incredible and beautiful the lighting in the show i think is really impressive and yeah, the animation, kind of the lighting, finale. everything has been great on this show. Any thoughts on that action sequence? That's a pretty typical Bad Batch sequence of action there. Yeah, I really like it. I liked all of the the fighting and stuff and going against the kind of Empire and the Bad Batch. And so far, I haven't been let down by any fight scene on this show. Yeah, I think these action scenes have been pretty good. Every character feels like they have the role they're playing in, like a role that only they could play. Like they all have their own ability and their own role in the fight. And it's also cool to see them fighting alongside Separatists. I wish they, like, I don't know how, they could have done a little bit more with the Separatist angle and, like, the fact that the Bad Bat doesn't quite trust this guy. But he only got 20 minutes, you know? Yeah. And I think they did it pretty well. And this was a fun action finale. I liked that he chose them the secret passage out of the way. And I think that's sort of, like, them finding common ground. You know, that's the droids common and the Bad Bat and the yep. Separatists all coming together. For It's sort of the theme of the episode. I miss when the Clone Wars would give us those little lines at the beginning. Like, Oh, here's the morality of the episode before we start. Yeah, yeah, they'd be like, "War never is good." Yeah, <laughs> that'd be an episode about how war is bad. Yep. But yeah, we, war. Uh, they what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. I think that's one of the lines from Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> George Lucas wrote that one. Yep. All right, they uh, t- the Bad Batch team returns. They're all happy. They won. They got their separate senator back. One more mission down, and. They arrive, and Sid's base is kind of popping. There's a bunch of people in there, a lot of noise, a lot of music. What's going on here? They show up, they return, and of course Omega is the center of attention. She's in there creaming everybody on hollow chest. Doing a great job at what's boss. Doing a great job at maintaining a low profile, you know? Yeah, this is certainly uh, what we needed when we're hiding out from dozens of uh, bounty hunters and and the Empire. And and Kamino. (laughs) <laughs> yeah just I would, great decision making all around by everybody especially in this in this like cd bar where surely there's a bounty hunter or two hanging out yeah. you know <laughs> yeah but they're all too impressed by omega's sick skills at the hollow chest board you know she's creaming them all she's winning all her money back and and then uh sid lets it drop that omega won so much cash here that their debt is paid off in the b plot and yeah. now they're free of the debt to Sid, which means theoretically they can go anywhere they want and leave this base behind. Yep. That's, I mean, I'm curious to see how much is. I feel like Sid can't be done in this show. Cause I feel like we'd. Have, maybe it's because I like the character, have grown to like the character so much recently, but I feel like we didn't get like a ceremoniously goodbye of like, oh, well, thanks for all the jobs you gave us and thanks for treating us like shit. Hasta luego. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of like, oh, thanks. So. Maybe we'll never get a ceremonious goodbye with Sid, but I hope this isn't the end of Sid on this show. I hope, I hope we see at least like a nice shaking of the hands type thing, you know? Yeah. It's always nice, especially... And I, I do wonder, like, sure, it could be goodbye for now, but how do we know, like, by the end of season one that she's not going to call him up? Be like, guys, I'm desperate. Can you do one job for me? And they're going to come back and have a reunion episode. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I it looks like they're free of Sid's... If it's Sid's money, they could go out and explore the world anywhere. It's a bit of an open end for the Bad Batch. We do know that Bounty Hunters are after Omega, but that's all we really got in terms of like yeah. a running plot at this point right now. Yeah, there's really... Yeah, Bounty Hunters are after. I'm still waiting for my Hondo appearance. It's not an animated show if Hondo doesn't show up. 
Yeah, but I think we got a lot ahead of it for the show, and I imagine... I don't know if it's got picked up for season two yet or not, actually, but... They've been pretty... I think they want to avoid, like, the whole... Like, oh yeah, this show's gonna be four seasons, and then for whatever reason it not catch on, and then only do, like, two or three and seem like failures. Like, part of me wonders, was Resistance always supposed to be two seasons, or was it kind of be like, no one cares about this fucking show, so we're just gonna end it and be like, oh, we did our two seasons, thanks for watching, everybody. Because, <laughs> um, like, we notice like, uh, like, all of these, like, Marvel shows and Disney shows, like, they know for really... Like, because the thing is, if Bad Batch is getting a season two, they have to be, like, the way animation is, they've had to be working on it for a while. Like, season two almost has to be done by the time season one premieres, just because of how long it takes to make animated shows. Like, two years before season two happens, you know? Yeah. Like, look at Boba Fett. Is that, like, a miniseries? Is that season one? Like, who knows? Like, the only show we know so far that's getting another season based on other than what we've gotten is the Mandalorian as far as Star Wars I mean I guess even the Marvel shows I don't know if we're like they I think WandaVision is supposed to only be a season but like and I know I guess they're making Captain America 4 with Anthony Mackie as Captain America but like could we be getting Captain America and the Winter Soldier basically a season 2 of Falcon and the Winter Soldier are we getting season 2 I can of see Loki that. are we getting you know yeah, I'm really curious because I know for a fact they told us WandaVision is a one season and done thing. They've said there's no yeah. season two, so but we're like, not getting any I more watched of that. that. Like, it's my least favorite so far of the Marvel shows, but even if I had loved every second of what they showed us, based on what they showed us, I didn't watch it and be like, oh, I can't wait for what this goes next. Like, it has a feeling of, like, this is it. That's it. We finished. Yeah, and, we're done. And I've gotten that from all the Marvel shows so far. Like, Falcon and the Winter Soldier had stuff that obviously is going to be picked up in future stories but i did feel like okay this is like the end of this story maybe we'll get a sequel or something but and i don't feel that with bad batches feels like an ongoing thing it feels like we're at least going to get a few seasons out of it i don't expect like 10 you know but i would i would bet like like three or four this more or less because they have set up the camino and uh rise against the empire but they I don't feel like we're getting that this season, so I feel like that's definitely, like, this arc of this series. So whenever... And I know I was pretty adamant, like, oh, yeah, that's the season one arc, the, like, rise against them... Camino's rise against the Empire, but now I'm feeling more like that's going to be the series finale. And is that the end of season two, and that's the end of the Bad Batch? Is that the end of season three, four, five? And I kind of... Marvel has me, uh, like, in these one-off season type things, like... The fact that we just got like a couple of weeks of WandaVision and it was yeah. over kind of was yeah. part of the fun. You know, we weren't like, okay, this very slow one episode a week, every week, every week, every week for years on end. And I would like the idea, like maybe that's what we'll get out of Book of Boba Fett and some of the live action shows, but I would kind of like the idea of like almost an anthology type yeah. show out of Star Wars. Like you get one or two seasons of Bad Batch, but then we cut yeah. it there and you get another animated series somewhere else in the world, you know? I think that's kind of fun. Part of the fun of Star Wars is getting all over the place, you know, and seeing the future, the past, and this side of the universe, this part of the universe, and it'd be nice. Yeah. Like, I don't want to limit us too much to one era and one group of people. Yeah, like Acolyte, the show that they're doing that's going to focus on the dark side is, you know, like 50 years before episode one, so. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to that. I've been reading my High Republic keeping up with that so i can drop some lore on you this time joe next yeah next i'm not talking about that i have trouble with reading i'm working on something right now that's not reading so uh, <laughs> that'll be a post off air conversation that's nothing important if you're listening to this be like what is it i'm really interested like don't be i'll, I'll talk about it probably on here <laughs> or other content as it happens but don't are be. we uh any any final theories now right, joe, that we've got i guess the bad batch final final thoughts is so the episode ends with hunter saying like oh if to omega like oh if you beat me in hollow chest then you'll get to go on all the rest of our missions my theory we're not going to see the end of that game but we're just going to see like the next mission starts and omega's like well i get to go on all the missions now because i beat you in hollow chest and hunter's going to be a mm-hmm. line of like well you know i was thinking more of like a best two out of three situation and <laughs> that's gonna be the end of that conversation and say and, oh i went easy on you or something like that yeah it's just some dumb thing and it's like oh okay i'm gonna beat him there we go <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, they made it clear Omega is missed, which is not on the team this week. So I definitely think going forward, she'll be part of the team. I wonder what her role is going to be. They've really into the serenity type thing. So I could see her being like the guy in the chair type role or something like that. I was going to say that's one of the ways you can have her involved without like having to fight. Mm Mm-hmm. And one of the things I wanted to go over to you is we have the uh, rest. We have all of the rest of the episodes of July, the titles released. So I kind of wanted to talk with you about them and what you think they might be about. So we we have all but the final two episodes, the 15th and the 16th episode. We don't know the titles for, but we do know the titles for. I'm ready for. to hear them. So next week's episode is titled Devil's Deal. Interesting. So Devil's Deal, I wonder... Is Mephisto going to be in that one? Yeah. So I'm curious, <laughs> like, what is that going to be? Like, a, oh, Omega got Sid all her money, but then it's like a double or nothing type of thing of, like, they Sid has a job for them, and it's like, okay, if you do this job and it works, like, I'll give you, like, a 80% of the money from this job, but if it doesn't work, then all your debt's back and that kind of situation. Or Like, I'm curious yeah, what not- it is. This also feels like it could potentially be a Hondo episode, just based off the title of Devil's Deal. Like, that does, seems like to be something I could see Hondo getting involved in. You're getting me excited there, Joe. Yeah, I'm not and quite we're sure, also like I don't at, know how much Sid we're going to get going forward. We're also out, like, we've kind of wrapped up a lot of the main the storyline right now, so I could see it being, like, a Hondo coming in. Like, oh, all your debts are paid to Sid. It's like, well... Like, they worked for Hondo, and it's like, now they owe Hondo money or something. I don't mm-hmm. know. So the episode after that... July 16th this title Rescue on Ryloth I feel like we could definitely get a Cham Syndulla maybe a Hera Syndulla uh, appearance I like that one I'd love to see that because I love Ripples my favorite animated show from Star Wars out of the two so or the three now I guess mm-hmm. but yeah I'd love to see Hera show up I like her a lot one of, my, one of the best characters uh, I've had I've, I've seen in Star Wars yeah definitely could see a young Hera and then the next one doesn't leave a whole lot it's just called Infested <laughs> that could be a bunch of different things. Not yeah, I was, really I was seeing that, that, and I was wondering, like, it reminds me of the episodes where it's like a virus outbreak, or like they're stuck on genosis, yeah. and there's like these, the genosis bugs are uh, almost like maybe like a horror-induced episode. Maybe the Bad Batch is stuck in some layer, and they're infested mm-hmm. with creatures. They gotta get out. Like I, that's what I'm imagining, some kind of bottle episode yeah. where they're stuck in they're stuck in some place, being becoming infested, and they gotta get out of it. Yeah, and then the final one, episode 14, is titled War Mantle, which I feel like is definitely more... I feel like if there's an episode where uh, 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 Crosshair gets his ship removed, it's in War Mantle, which, if you know, Operation War Mantle is basically the process of the clones getting replaced with just regular human beings in the Star Wars universe. So uh, that's my prediction is episode 14... Crosshair gets his chip removed and he dies somewhere in episode 15 or 16. Yeah, I think the fact that it's called War Mantle definitely tells me it's going to be an Empire centric episode. So, like, you probably won't get a ton of the Empire in the next couple, but then by the time we get to that one, it's going to be very much focused on Crosshair, very much focused on. I can't remember the name of the character now that I'm thinking about it, but there was some known character who was on his team, like a, a present female character who's one of his shock, one of his troopers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or but, was it was it a known or was it like a theory just because they looked similar? I think that's. Oh wait, I was theor- theoretically someone that was known. <laughs> yeah, because she like had a similar look, but it was like a translation from the animation in uh, Bad Batch versus like comic art, so it's like hard to be like, oh, this is the exact same person. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited yeah. to get more of the Empire stuff though, because I do think we haven't gotten a ton of lore and story stuff. We've gotten little tidbits of it. But I'd be curious to get a little bit more of from what the Empire is doing at this point and how they're building and what this clone storyline is going on. You know, Joe, get it's it's getting me hungry for some Star Wars food. Yep, and that's what I'm gonna be consuming as soon as Bad Batch ends with my canon <laughs> rewatch of everything from starting with I think even I think there's something even before Episode One. Let me look really quick. Um, I don't know. I don't have it up, but. You're not going to read through all of the High Republic also, and then all the books no, because I'm then... only I'm only doing a video. So okay, what I was working on, I'll just might as well say it now is I'm working <laughs> on compiling my list, and I'm making an Excel sheet of everything that's a movie, 
a TV episode or a short that's an actual, like, I'm not counting, like, the Galaxy of Adventures, which is just, like, oh, here's the entire story of Chewbacca, or here's the entire story of Han mm-hmm. Solo. It's just, like, the uh, Forces of Destiny shorts or maybe, like, a short from, like, a video game or just anything that's, like, a canon released short. And I'm watching them all in chronological order. But I'm not doing it in a way where I'm, like, stopping. So, like, when we get to Order 66 in Revenge of the Sith, I'm just going to watch Revenge of the Sith and then watch everything that came after that in chronological order. I'm not going to stop in the middle of the movie, watch all of the Order 66 scenes as Order 66 happens, and then cut back to Revenge of the Sith. I'm going to watch Revenge of the Sith and then watch everything else. Are you going to play Fallen Order and uh, Battlefront 2 campaign? Uh, No. That's how you really look at the timeline, Joe. I had a great experience doing. I would. Uh, I did that before Rise of Skywalker, and I did, like, as I was watching Rebels, I was also playing Fallen Order, and it was like in a similar era of Star Wars. So you're getting like these side by side tales of like these Jedi Knights trying to save the universe, and then of course it culminated in Rogue One, which I think really is really enhanced by all this expanded material. So I'm really excited to get your thoughts on that watch through, Joe. It's a, it's a good time. It's a good ride. Yeah. A lot of content. What the fuck? It's like not here anymore. Hold up. I'm about to have a panic attack because I spent like three hours working on this and now it's not here. So. You can always go to the history of the document if you need it, Joe. Uh, One thing I'm impressed on you watching. I don't know. But yeah, so people can watch it on, I don't know if you, people that are watching on the stream can see it real quick. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. I always like a good Star Wars rewatch. It's impressive every time how much yeah. they tie stuff together and how much actually fits into that. Like I made a joke, I was poetry at Ryan's, but I think Star Wars actually sometimes pulls that off. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm almost wowed when I'm able to watch something like the Mortis arc and then you watch Turn of the Jedi and you see all the parallels there and you see, you watch that and then you go and watch Rise of Skywalker and there's your connective tissue yep. there and it all really kind of comes together in this really messy but yeah. ultimately kind of really endearing way. Yeah, so I'm watching Revenge of the Sith and then I'm watching Clone Wars Season 7, Episode 10, The Phantom Apprentice then uh, Episode 11, Shattered then The Bad Batch Season 1, Aftermath. So I'm watching all of that uh, together. What a jam. That's such a good era. You're missing out, though. You got to get that Fallen Order uh, fixed. I've watched it. I love that moment. Like that, I want, want more of his uh, Cal Kestis' master in, um, in um, the Bad Batch. But, yeah, I'm working on that document right now. And the last part I did uh, as I'm just about to add the Mandalorian, working chronologically, and then I'm going to go through and double-check it. And this is going to take a while. I have it separated out by color so movies are red shorts are blue and tv episodes are green uh should be a fun fun experience i'm starting basically as soon as that friday after i watch bad batch that's when i'm starting on this and i hope to be finished before book of boba fett starts i'm curious to get your thoughts on that joe i might not be able to join you on the whole watch through but i've been thinking about doing a clone wars rewatch I haven't watched that in a long time, so I'm going to probably be doing a prequels into the Clone Wars kind of watch for me. Yeah. I've recently, not Star Wars related necessarily, but it is the Criterion sale at Barnes and Noble. So I've been oh, gathering nice. up a bunch of Criterion collections over the last few days. Uh, so if you're into expensive but really nice sets of films, you know, you got stuff like the trilogy, these trilogies that come with the box of all three movies and that kind of stuff. Criterion obviously does great work. And they're all half off at Barnes and Noble, so I'll go load up on some good stuff. Yeah, and people say that the whole like original trilogy area is packed when like we explore the area too much, and it's like okay, maybe we explore the area with books and video games and st- or books and comics and stuff. I know we're like very delving away from our Disney Plus review, <laughs> but I really don't care. But like I'm looking at it now, as far as like video content, right? We go from Rogue One. Then we have Star- immediately into Star Wars Episode Four. Then we have One Forces of Destiny short. Then we have Star Wars Episode Five. Then we have Two Forces of Destiny shorts, and then Star Wars Episode Six. I feel like we could put more in that timeline. It's- There's a ton to be fair. Like you mentioned, the fact that books and comics are like all over that 
that portion of the timeline. <laughs> like the whole Star Wars comic line is like, oh, here's a hundred issues of things that take place between episode four and five. You know. Yeah, I, I I just had to stop with like the books and the comics. It wasn't like people were complaining like oh part of it was getting like overwritten maybe i don't really care about like all this one scene it was like he's left-handed in the movie he's clearly right-handed i'm like i don't really care about that but it's more just the fact that there's so many things that happen that i'm like i can't i don't believe all of this happened i don't believe that luke han and leia went on 500 adventures between episode four and episode five i just that that's kind of where i was i feel like it's just too much going on that i can't believe this anymore yeah, for a while, for a few years, I was in everything. I was reading every issue, every comic. I was reading every book. And I was just, like, especially early when Disney first purchased it and, like, that built up to Force Awakens. And then after Force Awakens, built up to The Last Jedi. Like, that whole era, I was reading everything. And then, like, it turns out none of that really mattered. Like, <laughs> some of it has a little flavor on top, you know. But as you've seen from Bad Batch, what can and can just be changed. And yeah. that's just how it is. And Disney can say it's canon as much as they want until they don't want it to be anymore. Then they'll just, they'll just change it, you know. And mm-hmm. I think the books have all been consistently good, but the comics are way out there sometimes. So if something's going to be like moderately canon, <laughs> if it's not great, I'm not going to bother with it. And I yeah. think the books have all been really good, but the comics not so much. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'd love for the comics just to be like, hey, this is. This. I mean, I wanted to get into Doctor Actors, Doctor Aphra stuff just because it's different, but. I'd love for them to be like, yeah, this is a comic about fucking Bob, you know, Smith. And he's a fucking pilot during the time of, like, after Return of the Jedi. And here's the story of Bob Smith, the pilot. And it's not really connected a whole lot. It's just his adventures as a pilot. Yeah, for me, the comics are like, if you're desperate for Star Wars and you're like, (laughs) I just want content. Like, give me something to consume of Star Wars. Like, there's a lot of stories out there, but some are better than others and you got and unfortunately with the comics i do feel like you have to read most of it like even the bad stuff <laughs> to get to the good stuff yeah. so unless you're invested it's just a lot to take on and there are some good short stories like the uh there's some in the uh what's the the book the like anthology book that takes time during or takes from a place certain dur- point of view yeah, from a certain point of view that takes place during a new hope like the bale and brea storyline is like amazing Uh, I would love to get into the expanded universe of Star Wars again. Uh, I'm trying yeah. to with this High Republic. It was a perfect yeah. starting point, and I've been very into it. So I, yeah. I honestly feel like it's a good entry point because it's so removed. Like you said, it's like a hundred, hundred yeah. years or whatever before Force uh, for, uh, Phantom Menace. Yeah. So it's a pretty separate story. What are, what's so like the really, villain? Looking to jump like in, jump in. Pirates or some shit or what are they? Yeah, there's this there's this evil force brewing. I've only read the first book out of. Uh, three at this point, so I don't have a super clear picture, but you get, you get a good idea of who the villains are, and I like that it's like this early era of Star Wars because like the Jedi aren't quite figured out yet, and the, and the whole Republic isn't really quite figured out yet, so the whole thing is still kind of new, and they've like, for example, just discovered hyperspace is kind of a new thing, and the kickoff yeah. of the first book is this big huge hyperspace crash where the main character's ship gets into this big collision in a hyperspace lane which is supposed to be impossible and it creates this big rift in, in between the outer rim and the, in, in the inner rim and it's, it's interesting I like it a lot oh, okay yeah I might check it out probably not though to be honest not because <laughs> of like you recommending it it's just that I have trouble reading check out the audible it, yeah that's true I'm better with they got sound effects and everything you got, I have like, like noises you know an opening crawl that's how I quote unquote read every Star Wars book I've ever read whether it was but yeah, because there was that time too where you were talking, I was like audibling all the Star Wars books. Like I did, uh, what's the uh, Catalyst? I did Tarkin. I did uh, a bunch of them. I Lost Stars, like that whole era of books. Ahsoka. Yeah, yeah I think Audible is the way to do it because again, music and all that kind of stuff. Like when I did uh, Lost Apprentice on there, and you get kind of like the music cue, cue comes up oh. whenever Clyde guys talking about the Force and. Especially if you get a good performer, like he pulled off the Qui Gon voice perfectly, it, yeah. and then you just get like the Force theme come in, and he's talking about this mystical thing of the Force, and I like it a lot. We're way off of Bad Batch at this point, but yeah, if you're trying yeah, to get out of Star Wars, yeah, we're, <laughs> go we, for the we, books. 
Yeah, all right. We'll probably continue this conversation off air, but I'm going to end the stream so it doesn't take three hours to upload. So, uh, yeah, join us next week. Uh, this episode is going to debut. I think it's a live premiere tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, and I'll probably just try to keep that the same so there's some consistency for the rest of our Disney Plus reviews. But that might change. If there's a string where we're able to record them on Fridays, I might change it to noon, but fuck it. Who knows?